Um, first, a little bit about myself. My name is Cici Huang, and I'm currently working at Google as a senior software engineer. Uh, I just reached my three years of contributing to a uh, Kubernetes community. I initially started in SIG uh, Cloud Provider, and I won the Kubernetes Contributor Award, I think, that year, um, 2020. And then I shifted to um, SIG API Machinery. I'm currently a contributor to SIG API Machinery with focus of the extensible features. And uh, additionally, uh, I have served as the release lead for the Kubernetes 125, and I was the release manager for the past uh, 127 release, which we just released it yet last week. So today, I'm going to talk about the customer resource definitions and uh, the effort we did to make it more self-contained. We got a bunch to cover today. Um, I'll begin with like uh, reviewing the journey of CRD in the past, and uh, then talk a little bit about the common expression language, which also known as Cell, and then talk about uh, like how we leverage the power of Cell and make CRD even more self-contained. And also, I will talk about the other areas uh, we, we were able to expand the power, uh, things like policy enforcement area. And uh, I'll leave a couple minutes for Q&A in the end. Let's get it started then. The journey of CRD. So in the very early stage in Kubernetes, we have realized that keep adding the built-in uh, APIs is not going to be a long-standing solution for a variety of usage. That's when customer resource definition comes into picture. And it initially known as the third party resource and has been in stable since uh, 116. So it allows users to extend and customize the Kubernetes API with their own resources. And it still remains one of the most important extension mechanisms inside Kubernetes. So many core Kubernetes functions are now built using customer resources and it makes Kubernetes more modular. So in the past, we have made a lot of effort to try to make CRD as good as built-in types. So we added versioning support, we added sub-resources, we uh, added open API schema, structure schema, and many other features. But along the way, there's a topic continuously being brought up, the validation. So why are validation so critical? I guess the answer lies in the fact that if you don't validate the data comes into your system, later things are going to break in a way that is hard to reason, and the debug at that point is going to be much more difficult. <coughs> Excuse me. So it is important to tell developers what they did wrong at the time when the request is submitted and give them the chance to fix it right away. But unfortunately, it's not what's happening with CRDs for quite some time. You just can't write all the validations you want with your CRD. And since your controller doesn't support, you just have to wait um, till your controller break and report an error somewhere and go ahead and fix it. So I have listed a couple um, examples of the validations people really wanted to do uh, with CRDs. For example, they want to enforce a field is immutable. They want to do some cross-field checks. And they want to make sure that two fields are mutually exclusive or they just, want to be, uh, they just want a specific format to be applied to their fields. And <clears throat> for quite some time, the building validations for CRD was mainly done through structure schema and the OpenPIv3 uh, validation. So for any use cases that cannot be supported by those two, a validating admission webhook is required, which causes a lot of pain. So introducing a production-grade uh, webhook is not only a substantial development work, but also increased the operational complexity dramatically. As a basically separate component added into your system, whenever you try to introduce a webhook, there are a lot of things you, uh, you need to think carefully, things like how to package it, how to release it, how to integrate it with your existing uh, monitoring or alerting system, um, how, how to um, upgrade it, or how to draw it back when needed. What about the latency it added? Like how to scale it? And many others. And to make it even worse, webhook is very easy to misconfigure. So a common example would be the uh, failure policy, which you have to choose either fail open or fail closed when you try to set up your webhook. So if you go with fail open, which basically says if your webhook uh, running into uh, issues, either it become unavailable or it return errors, you just, you just will let the request through anyway. 
And if your webhook is set up to do some security check, it's clearly be a problem. On the other hand, if you go with fill closed, which basically says if your webhook um, has any issues, then you're going to reject all the requests which was routed into your webhook. And if your webhook is designed to match all the ports or something, then you basically lose your control plane availability for that. So I guess over time, people have learned to be more cautious about their webhooks. But webhooks is still remain the leading cause of control plane outage. So for quite a while, webhook is on the only solution for the functionalities we want. And uh, what we could do here, so after the research, we found that the vast majority of the use cases people want to do with their CRD validation are pretty simple. They wanted to ensure a field is immutable. They want to apply a specific format uh, to their fields, or they want to do some basic cross-field checks. So the question becomes, can we use something simpler than webhook? Here is the tool we propose, the common expression language, also known as cell. And uh, <coughs> before we even dive into the uh, documentation from cell, let's first take a look at a couple examples. I'm, go I'm not going to read through all those three examples, but if you know any of the C-like programming language, you might find that it's easy to guess um, what those codes are doing. And your guess is probably right. So here is the documentation I took, I took from Cell, which ex explains it really well. So um, Cell is an open source portable expression language which implements common semantics for expression evaluation. It's designed to be simple and efficient. It's a typed language, which comes with a nice syntax checker. You can just run type check on it. And it's easy to extend and easy to be embedded. We have successfully integrated it with Kubernetes data system for both CRD and native types. And worth to mention that it got a pretty solid adoption now. So here is two major limitations you might want to be aware of uh, for Cell. The first one is Cell doesn't come with the native support for for and while looping, and you have to use the comprehension form for that. And Cell also don't support if else conditionals, and we have to use the ternary operator instead. A question might, come, uh, might occur to you pretty quick is that, is there any utility library in Cell I could take advantage of? The answer, of course, is yes. Cell comes with a standard library together with an extended library. And we also went ahead and built an even more extended library, uh, which is available now in Kubernetes, including things like more list processing, more regular expression, and the first class support for URLs. So due to time, I am not able to show like many examples here, but please feel free to check out the documentation we just added in Kubernetes um, past couple of weeks, and together with the cell documentations for more examples and guidance on how you can write your own cell rules. So now, let's dive deep into the area, like how we can leverage the power of cell and make CRD more self-contained. The answer is the validation rules. We introduced a, a new feature called CRD validation rules in 123 as an offer feature, and it now stays in beta since 125. We are working on uh, to promote it to GA pretty shortly. So all the magic was done through one single field, x-kubernetes-validations. Let's take a look at how it could be used. <coughs> so as an extension field we added into CRD, you basically can write it anywhere under OpenAPI v3 schema. And then you can just start writing your cell rules under this extension field. So when creating or updating a customer service, uh, sorry, when creating or updating a customer resource, uh, it will be validated against the rule you defined. So in this example, we want to make sure that the replicas number you set is no greater than the max replicas set. And, <coughs> excuse me. So inside your cell rules, self is a cell variable. It provides access to validations scoped to current schema. So as an example here, we put the x-kubernetes-validations in the spec level. So self will be scoped to um, spec, which gives it access to all the fields following, in this example, the replicas and max replicas. Also, we provided another cell variable called old self, which refers to the existing data while you're updating your CRD. And <coughs> if you use that, 
the cell expression is called a transition rules, which could help you to uh, be able to enforce the immutability of a field. Or you can just uh, verify the list which are append only. Or you can do something like uh, you want a map with the mutable values, but an immutable um, case. And in this case, um, the cell rules we wrote here is ensures the immutability of the full field. And my colleague, Alexander uh, Venlisky, has already wrote a blog regarding this, um, the use cases about the immutability. Um, please feel free to take a look if you're interested. And another thing worth to mention that you can write multiple cell rules in multiple places. So here in this example, those two um, cell rules are doing the exactly same checking, but scoped differently. So the first one is scoped on spec level which requires you to first check if the full field is existing or not, because the field is um, optional. But the second, um, second example here, which the cell rules is scoped in the field four level, so you don't need the existence check. And it will be validated only when the field is present. So sometimes you need to port the rule a little bit higher in the schema tree just to give it access to more fields if you do some cross fields validation. But we, we will always encourage you to scope the cell rules as nearly as possible, and it makes it easy to write. <coughs> a thing I mentioned earlier is that cell is a typed language, so we're going to support the type checking in your CRD. So in this case, if you mistyped the field replicas, it will be caught immediately when you try to create or update your CRD, and a nice error will be returned. Also, we support you to use the cell expressions to, to specify a human readable failure message through the message expression field here. So, just like other features added in Kubernetes, when we added the CRD validation rules, we want to pre prevent it from being abused. And uh, even though cell is designed to sandbox code execution, it's possible to write cell rules, which will take too long to run. And we have some safety guards in place for this. Uh, we do static analysis and, code uh, and cost estimation ahead of time. So if the cell rule you wrote might take too long to run, uh, we will fill the request while creating or updating your CRD and with a nice message. And we also have limits set in the runtime as well. On top of that, we don't want to waste time on validations if the resource creation or update request has already been canceled. So we also support the context cancellation. So with CRD validation rules in place, uh, if we take a look at CRD, there's still one missing piece before we can call CRD fully self-contained. Uh, self the version support, the version conversion. So as I mentioned earlier, we added the versioning support to CRD to offer the possibility to indicate the uh, stability level of your customer resource definition or advance your CRD to a, uh, your API to a new version. So it means that the customer resource could possibly be served in a different version than the version it stored. To make it possible, the customer resource object must support conversion between the, ver the version they are stored at and the version they are served at. And the current way of, of supporting CRD version conversion is through the webhook um, conversion, which is stable as a feature since 116. But it is pretty complicated to configure, as you can see here. And it also involves, a, uh, it also requires a webhook to be in place, which falls into all the pen points we mentioned earlier. And besides that, it also dramatically decreased the CRD scalability number due to the latency it added. So we found that it falls into the similar pattern that the majority of the use cases are as simple as people just want to rename their field or they want to put their field in a different location or they want to change the type of their field. The pain is really to use webhook to do so. So can we leverage the power of cell in here? The answer is yes. And we know that the KCP project has already um, having a working impl impl implementation for this, which we're really excited about. And we hope we could bring it to Kubernetes. And uh, here is a draft cap for supporting CRD conversion with cell. Similarly, as CRD validation rules we just talked about, 
it's going to be specified inside your CRD, and uh, uh, it will make your CRD even more self-contained, and we hope it could be a sufficient substitute to the conversion webhook. And worth mention that nothing is fixed yet, so it's still in a pretty early stage. We are working on collecting use cases and uh, prototyping in the past couple of weeks. So, <coughs> so we really want to have a general, a general way to do object mutation in Kubernetes, and uh, rather than making it like super tight with the CRD version conversion. So please feel free to join the discussion if you're interested. Now, after the declarative validation and the conversion with the cell uh, in place for CRD, if we really think about it, CRD will become even more self-content than the native types. So what are we gonna do next? We plan to catch up on native types with the declarative validations. So here is an open um, draft cap against the 128 already, and uh, please feel free to join the discussion. So um, since CRD also embed native types, for example, the pod template, so we believe with the declarative validation on native types in place, it will also benefit CRD. After a bunch of work we did in CRD, <coughs> we started to look for other areas which we can expand the power, and the policy enforcement enters the picture. We found that the biggest area where webhooks are used is actually policy enforcement. So how normally people will do policy enforcement? They either do it through some internal support, or they do it through some like policy engine, for example, OpenGitKeeper or Kvarno, or they have to build their own webhooks for do so. And it took us a lot of time to understand what uh, people really want to achieve in this area. And we go ahead and talk to many people. We talk to people who uh, need policy. Uh, we talk to people who are the man uh, maintainers in the major um, policy engines. We talk to other people who suffered from like the webhooks they, they have to build. <coughs> and we think it's really a big space. And people already did a lot of awesome stuff there. So what we try to do is we try to really focus inside Kubernetes um, things we could do uh, in Kubernetes to make this one um, policy enforcement point better with minimum the usage of webhooks. So the outcome is the validating admission policy. We introduced this feature as alpha since 126, and we added a bunch of awesome stuff in the past 127. And I'm gonna spend a couple minutes to talk about this. So what we have learned is that there are usually two major roles uh, involved in policy management world, the policy author and the cluster administrator. So they are usually not the same person or not even in the same organization. So for the policy, uh, for the policy author, what they cared about is the correctness of a policy. So in our case, they will be the ones who write the cell rules. So they want to make sure the rules they write is correct and they also care about the reusability of the policy because they want their policy to be able to um, serve for multiple organizations. So they want uh, to make the policy sufficiently configurable to be able to support more than just one organization. So on the other hand, the cluster administrator uh, more concerned about the policy that matches the goal of their own organization. And they also concern about the operability of the policy. We all know that rolling out a security policy could be scary, and they want to make sure that it works as safely as possible. <coughs> so what we've done is we introduced a couple new Kubernetes resources that aligns with the different responsibilities. So the policy author's uh, responsibility, the policy author will be responsible for writing something called validating admission policy. And here, uh, they, in the uh, match constraints, they will define which resources this policy applies to. And it, it works very similar as what, uh, to what Webhook works today. And uh, then they can just start to write a bunch of cell rules to explain what this policy does under the validations. So they can refer to um, cell variables like object, old object, and uh, the params, which is used to make this policy configurable. 
And then they will use the param kind field to define which resources they are going to use to parameterize the policy. So in this case, we are using config map, but you can also use other resources or even a CRD if you need. Next, the cluster admi administrator is going to create something called validating admission policy bending. So the, what bending is doing is really to connect this policy to their cluster. So here in the policy name, uh, it says which policy they are binding to their cluster. And the param ref says which object they are using to parameterize their policy. <coughs> Excuse me. And also, they could use mesh resources to further constrain what resources in their cluster the policy applies to. So in the example here, uh, the cluster admin really just wanted this policy to be applied to the test namespaces with the um, with the max replicas number set to three in their param resources. And of course, the cluster admin can go ahead and create a separate binding, which bound this policy to their production uh, namespace and uh, use a different number for their uh, max replicas. And lastly, uh, the cluster admin can use the validation action field to declare how they want the validation of the policy to be enforced. And we'll talk about it later. And if you really think there's no need uh, to have parameterization in your case, you can easily simplify it uh, to, by removing the param-related fields. And the cluster administrator just needs to single bind it to your cluster, and then you're done. Due to the time, I might not able to touch all the details, but I do want to mention a couple of best practices we would recommend here. So the first one is, of course, the parameterization. As we talked earlier, it really, <coughs> we introduced the param resources as a way to improve the configura uh, configurability. And it greatly improved the reusability of your policy uh, as, fi as fine ground the usage to better align with the specific goal of your own, uh, uh, your own organization. And the second is the way uh, you, you can use to specify which resource the policy gonna apply to. As we mentioned earlier, the policy author can use the, something called match constraints in the policy to define which resources they want this policy to apply to. And the cl cluster administrator can use something called match resources in the binding to further constrain uh, the resources they want to apply it to. And in the past 127, we added something called match conditions, which will give you the power to further fine ground the request filtering using cell expressions. So um, previously, uh, sometimes it was tricky if you want to be able to match like multiple resources. You have to either specify all the resources you want this policy applied to, or you can use a wildcard, which basically matching everything. But with the uh, match conditions field in place, <coughs> it becomes easier, as, again, as the example shows here. You can see I want this policy applies to everything but RBAC request or something, um, or depending on like what you really need. The third one is the way to define the expected behavior when something goes wrong. So failure policy really defines how to handle failures for the admission policy. And the failures could occur either like a, um, something wrong with the cell itself, or like something went wrong in the runtime, or like you have some misconfiguration there. And we previously mentioned that using fail closed in webhooks can negatively impact the cluster uh, availability. But the field closed sometimes is very usable, especially when you're enforcing a compliance. So I want to specifically mention that the in-process admission control which we um, provided has a fundamental advantage over webhooks. It is far safe to use in a field closed mode because it uh, removes the network as a possible failure domain. And also worth to mention that if you set your fail policy to be fail, which is basically fail closed, then the failures will be enforced as the way validation action defined. So on the other hand, the cluster admins will be given the power to specify how validations are enforced using the validation action in bindings. So if a validation value is to force, then it's always enforced according to these actions. And we, pre we previously um, talked about uh, how tricky the rollout could be. And the cluster admins really want to make sure it has, it's uh, been done as safe as possible. So 
And sometimes the class or means might want to roll out a bunch of policies without knowing all the details inside of the policy. So here we offered a, um, the, a state which the rolled out policy cannot cause uh, the rejection. And then the cluster admin can monitor uh, metrics, warnings, or audit events along the way uh, until, uh, uh, until they think it's ready to deny the request. So the last one is the authorization check. So we added the ability to perform auth check for the, uh, for the admission request user through authorizer variable. And it, for example, we can check if the principal submitting the request is authorized to certain parts, resources, or even the service account. Um, I might don't have enough time to talk about it in all details, but my colleague Joe Bass has wrote a very nice documentation on the capabilities the auth check will provide, and together with a couple, uh, a lot of examples. So, I'm really excited to share that the whole ecosystem has been aware of the effort we did. And I heard uh, um, our feature has been mentioned uh, like a couple times in the other talks in KubeCon um, in recent days as well. So, uh, and also some like uh, main um, policy engines such like Opa Gatekeeper and Kavano is working on adoption already. And uh, the maintainers from KubeScape um, ha has already tried our feature and wrote a nice blog about it, which just published last week. So we understand that this feature is still in alpha and it might take a long time before it's ready to be used in production. So what if people want to try it early? So we'll be offering an out-of-tree implementation for the same uh, functionalities uh, and uh, to whoever interested to try it early. And we also hope this will help the future possible migrations as well. So what's the key takeaways? We all know that we have a bunch of use cases which uh, we're pretty familiar with, like uh, development, uh, like uh, deployments, jobs, which can be covered by declarative APIs. And we have another bunch of use cases which can only be done through, exten uh, through extension mechanisms, things we talked about today, like CRD, advanced, uh, advanced validations, the, conver the version conversion, uh, the policy enforcement. We really think Thel uh, gives us the power to expand uh, uh, the declarative API to be able to cover a lot of use cases which can only be covered by extension matching terms previously. What's our next plan? Um, I already um, touched a like, uh, um, couple of bullet points here previously, but I wanted to mention we also plan uh, to um, have something called mutating admission policy to support the mutation use cases in admission. And uh, my colleague Andrew Sankim already uh, go ahead and uh, uh, raised the um, draft cap for that. And also there is another draft proposal raised from 6CRI to have a client-side validation tool in place, which offers the ability to do um, some shift-left validations. So if you're interested, please feel free to uh, reach out. And I'm open for questions. Thank you.